Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, Joint Replacement 101, Timing and Techniques. Joint replacement can help relieve pain and enable you to live a fuller, more active life. According to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, almost 1.25 million hip and knee replacement surgeries were performed in 2019 in the United States alone, making them some of the most common orthopedic procedures performed today. Total joint replacement is a surgical procedure in which parts of an arthritic or damaged joint are removed and replaced with a metal, plastic, or ceramic device called a prosthesis. The prosthesis is designed to replicate the movement of a normal, healthy joint. If consideration of joint replacement surgery is ultimately part of your health care plan, know that your doctor and care team want you to be as healthy, pain-free, and restored in function as possible. Today on Health360 with Dr. G, we're talking joint replacement 101, timing, and techniques. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board-certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Follow me across all the socials at Health360, WDrG, and check me out on my website at health360podcast.com. We have a great show for you today and an awesome guest that I've known for nearly 20 years. Before you meet him, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get after it, y'all. I'm going to introduce my longtime friend and colleague. He and I go back to our days at Loyola almost 20 years ago. It's like 19 years ago. I'm rounding up a little bit. But he and I go way back, uh, walk through the halls of Loyola together during our residencies. But I want to introduce you to, to my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Dennis Williams. Let me read you his credentials because his credentials run deep. Dr. Dennis Williams, MD, is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon with Swedish Medical Group. He's also the chairman, Department of Surgery at Swedish Hospital. Doc, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Dr. Gomez. Uh, we do go way back. You look almost exactly the same. I remember walking <laughs> down the halls in Loyola like it was yesterday. Oh Congratulations gosh, on your show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Doc, every comic book hero has an origin story. Give it to us, my friend. Where did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to medical school and residency? And just why is this topic so important to you every day? Go and give some okay. story, my friend. Okay. Well, you and I both met in Loyola uh, while we were doing residency. <laughs> my, my life story is a little bit long. I'll give you the short version. Um, I grew up in Nigeria. Uh, I left Nigeria at the age of 10, moved to the Middle East. Uh, my father traveled a quite a bit for his job, and then ended up in Canada where I went to high school as well as in college. I moved to US in about uh, 1999, and that's why I started medical school. I started residency where I met you in Chicago here uh, in 2004 at Loyola in Maywood. And then I went on to do a fellowship in sports medicine and children elbow reconstruction in Los Angeles in 2009. And from there, and I went on to be a practicing bird certified uh, orthopedic surgeon. I've been practicing for about 10 years now. Wonderful. And why is this topic so important to you today? You know, I think about the people that have come in your office. What, what makes you get up in the morning and do what you got to do each and every day as a physician, as an orthopedic surgeon? Yeah, I, you know, I say this to my patients all day. You know, one of the, the, the most joyful things about what we do is, you know, we help people and people say thank you. So, for me, it's a combination of working with my hands, uh, making people happy, and really getting fulfillment of what I do. That is so awesome. Well, I love your journey. So there you have it, everybody. Just met Dr. Dennis Williams. Here's how the show works. I ask the questions. Doc's going to give us some awesome answers. I'll participate on the easy ones because that's how I get down. That's how people know on the show. I love it. Now, I'm just joking. Now, we're here to help you be the best version of yourself. And this topic is so timely for so many people. So, Doc... When people come into yeah. the office, we call it the chief complaint. And yeah. so the chief complaint, AKA the question of the hour is this, what should patients know about joint replacement surgery? So doc, here's the first question for you. <clears throat> uh, and I just want to just, maybe we'll start with some just kind of overview stuff before we get into some of the other sections, but I like this question here. So people always want to know, when is a total joint replacement recommended? When is it needed? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, when I approach a, a patient with that kind of question, I say to them, number one, what have you done? And what are you feeling? I try to get a gauge. 
what does pain really mean to you? Are you taking pain medicines? Are you taking just simply an anti-inflammatory anti once every other day? Are you taking it four times a day? Are you having a difficulty sleeping? Are you able to do things like go to the mall or play with your grandkids and things like that? So you have to kind of get a gauge of what they've done. If they're able to do most things with an anti-inflammatory once a day, that's fine. I would say continue on with your life. But now if you're taking such high doses that you start you know, worrying about damaging your stomach or your kidneys, you're not able to sleep, you're having issues with simply you know, bending down or walking and doing regular tasks, now it's time to talk about more invasive things. So the more invasive we go, we can get from doing things like steroid injections to perhaps slightly more invasive things. And then the last thing up the ladder of invasiveness is a joint replacement. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate it. You know, I always say, you know, you really hit on the hit the head on the nail that, you know, quality of life just impacting your day to day. And if you tried all these different measures, you know, you try it and you still can't enjoy your quality. That's when you're having these these really important conversations, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, it, it's really a, a personal decision, but you, t you take the first steps and you say, okay, is this something that I can deal with? And then you go into the next measure and you say, okay, is this something I can continue with? For instance, if you start doing injections, you can almost do those indefinitely, but once they stop working and you're doing them at too frequent of intervals where you start now damaging potential other, other structures in the body, that's when it's time to have that conversation about having a joint replacement. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So let's, let me ask this question. Can you give us a little bit of a historical sense? You know, what do we know yeah. about just kind of the historical evolution of joint yeah. replacement surgery? Because I know it's been around for a long time, but, but right. what's, the, what's the journey? Where was it? And then where do you think this is going? Correct. So the real first joint replacements were done perhaps in the late 1800s in Germany. Uh, hips and knees were trialed at that time. And they were not very successful. A lot of times there were infections and things that happened. Um, the real uh, modern day joint replacements were done in the 1960s. Uh, and from then really, there's only been small evolutions of them, perhaps in you know, some of the sterile techniques, uh, some of the techniques in performing the operation and some of the materials used. However, the, the, the new style of joint replacements started in the 1960s. So we're about 60 years into the evolution of that. I appreciate that. And just really, where do you think this is going? Let me ask you this, you know, let's put on our future hat. Uh, yeah. You know, what does joint replacement look like in the future in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. So the, the newest things that we're doing in joint replacements is pain control. I think, you know, we've mastered some of the techniques where uh, still an evolution in the preciseness of, of making some of the operations even better than they are today using things like computer navigation. But now the next step is, you know, the, the pain control. The ultimate would be to get a perfectly aligned joint in the body in the setting of essentially no pain. We can do that perhaps for about 24 hours with some of the regional blocks where we block the pain completely. But I think the idea in the future would be to even go beyond that where you can have perhaps a painless recovery. And that is something that we look forward to in some of the things that we do around the time of surgery now. I appreciate that, you know, and we'll see how it happens. But, but it's like, it's like this journey, even though we've been, in, as you said, Doc, this journey, maybe over the last 60 years and kind of the modern joint place. But I do feel like that the future is really exciting. Uh, I know when I look at that in my practice, some of the patients that come in, they say, you know, you know, are, are the docs doing things differently? And I say, absolutely. We know a lot more than we did, you know, back then. And, and we're continuing to push the envelope on innovation. I love how you said about, you know, using computer modeling, um, Chuck's 3D printing, uh, virtual reality, robotic assistive procedures. I think this is a really exciting time. And it's awesome that you are part of this uh, generation. I appreciate you. Yeah, it, it is exciting. You know, every day we learn new things. Every meeting we go to, we, we learn new techniques, um, muscle sparing techniques, less damage to the body, uh, which means an earlier recovery, means less pain. It means more stability, means more range of motion. Materials are getting better where, you know, a lot of the early failures that we had were perhaps due to some of the materials. Technically things were done well, but the materials weren't good enough. Now the materials are getting better. Our alignment is getting better. A knowledge of anatomy is getting better. 
and pain control is getting better. And so over, over time, things have evolved and it's actually evolving at a very rapid pace. Wonderful. So doc, t- give us a sense of which joints are being replaced. I know I said in my opening remarks, you know, most commonly yeah. hips and knees, but yeah. what other joints are being replaced by you and your yeah. colleagues in the field? Yeah. So the, probably the most common joint being replaced is the knee. Uh, there's a high prevalence of knee arthritis, and that's probably the most common one. The next most common is the hip. Um, beyond that, we have shoulders, which are getting increasingly more uh, common and using it for uh, wider indications, meaning different types of pathologies. But essentially, any joint can be replaced now. Elbows are being replaced. Wrists are being replaced. We have artificial discs uh, in the vertebra being replaced. Uh, really, you know, little joints and fingers are being replaced. Uh, they're not quite as common and as durable as perhaps knee, uh, knees are, but yeah, a lot of joints are being replaced nowadays. Yeah, um, Dr. Williams, I think about how, you know, for us people that that, that move, you know, we all want to move with purpose, with passion, and, and many of us don't take that for granted. And, and yeah. what you guys are trying to do with the replacements to try to simulate natural movement and restore function and reduce pain. And I think that's just such a, a good thing that, that we have to keep doing for people out there. Because again, I know you guys as surgeons want people to be the best versions of themselves. Yeah, this is a conversation that I have with people in my office all the time. And I say, you know, it, it's there's a reason why an 18 year old or a 25 year old can run faster than perhaps a 40 year old who is still relatively young. But you can also tell, you know, as we get older, we slow down. We see it in animals. You can simply look at a, at, at a dog and tell the dog is a young dog by the way they move versus an old dog that hobbles a little bit slower. You know, there's this concept of, you know, lifespan and health span. And with joint replacement, we're trying to increase our health span so we stay healthier and we can enjoy our life a little bit longer. And that's really one of our goals as you do things in, with functional medicine, uh, ensuring that we, we live a, a, a very healthy life, keeping our brains and our heart young. Uh, we try and do the same, keeping our body young. It's uh, really a parallel uh, goal that we have. It really is. And I love it when I see people come through after they've had the replacements and they are more active, you know, from my end as a primary care physician, I can see, see those benefits. We can track those metrics. They're moving better. Next thing you know, their, their metabolic numbers are better. You know, it's just, it's a lot of things. We'll see glucose levels come down, diabetes, get better control, blood pressure, get better controlled, weight come down. So all this other good stuff and people having a restoration, it really is very mutual in what you guys are doing and what we're doing as well. It's just part of the same continuum. Absolutely. I, I think in healthcare, things go hand in hand. And it's, it's you know, you, you make me think about a, a very uh, common scenario that I see. I, I see sometimes patients who are uh, clearly in need of a joint replacement, uh, but perhaps they are slightly overweight and um, <clears throat> they may not uh, do as well postoperatively. If you're larger, you may not rehab as quick and things like that, and things may slow them down. You can even go to the more extreme levels where you have people who are morbidly obese or or very overweight, and those people don't qualify. And then becomes a vicious circle where being very, very overweight prevents you from having a joint replacement because of certain complications. Mm. But the reverse is also true. If you can get magically to the number where it's safe and get healthy uh, enough to have your joint replacement, it makes you healthier because you can move again. You have better mental health because of that. You get better cardiovascular health and so on and so forth. Excellent. Let me ask a couple other of these general questions for you. Let's see this one. I like this here. Um, so what questions should patients ask their orthopedic surgeon yeah. when considering joint replacement? What's your take? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a very good question. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you that the number one uh, predictor of uh, a good outcome is someone who is a high volume surgeon. So if you're going to have something done, you want it being done by someone who does it all the time because it's repetition. There's so many little nuanced uh, uh, things that happen during a procedure. So a high volume surgeon is, is definitely someone that you want and high volume in the particular joint that you want. The second thing that I would look for is someone who is what we call fellowship trained in that area. Well, I, in my uh, earlier years, did a lot of hip and knees just because of the sheer volume that I was seeing. Now I do predominantly shoulders. 
So if you have a shoulder problem, I'm probably the best person to do that. I, I'm very comfortable speaking about hips and knees just because of historically my practice. Uh, but you would want someone who is fellowship trained in that area, meaning they're trained specifically in hip and knee replacements and have an exceedingly high volume, meaning that they do this on a high, uh, highly repetitive basis. Uh, I recently underwent the knife and one of the things I looked for for the person was what was their particular volume uh, in that area. And I know that the person was high volume. I was extremely comfortable and I knew I was in the right hands. Wonderful. I appreciate it. Let's see this one. I like this one. Uh, any other tips out there that can help to get patients ready for their joint replacement? And I would say like maybe the, the, the lead into this is that, you know, when we're thinking about joint replacement, yes, people have to be ready, you know, mentally, physically, Absolutely. psychologically, you know, and socially as well too. What are some tips out there for people to get ready? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, again, uh, exactly what you said, everything is a mindset, right? Uh, if I'm going to have a joint replacement in my mind, I want to know I've done everything possible to be ready. So what does that mean? It means that I've taken anti-inflammatories. I've had joint injections and probably had some therapy. So in my mind, I've done everything. There's no turning back now. I'm ready to have a joint replacement. I think that's one aspect of the mental component. Another aspect that we have to do is we need to heal. So we need to have a good nutritional environment to allow that healing response to occur. And so that means leading up to that, you want to, you know, not just have a diet of potato chips and, and diet Coke. You want, you have, you know, good vegetables, uh, good protein sources. You want to be able to, you know, perhaps take some of your zinc and vitamin C, all the things that would promote a good healing environment. Um, smokers, no go. Smoking delays healing and increases your risk of infection. So if you smoke, I would say definitely stop and hopefully stop indefinitely, but at least during the healing period. Um, I think those are the things that I would really, you know, focus on, you know, promoting the healing environment and psychologically, like you mentioned, uh, be prepared for it. All right. Excellent. So I want to do a section here that we call frequently asked questions. And I want to yeah. really, these are some things that I know people ask me quite a bit. And then when I send to to my orthopedic colleagues, I know they can really just pass the baton and just, I can pass it to my colleagues and they can yeah. really go out there for them. But I want to give you a couple of these. So here we go. I like this one. If I do not have surgery, what is the risk? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think uh, surgery again is, is a very personal choice. Uh, if you don't have surgery and you have lifestyle limiting pain, I would say in, in the worst case scenario, your risk is you're not going to be walking. And even worse than that, you could be very unhappy and depressed. Um, you know, I, I think you can look at it uh, from the extreme of being, you know, completely incapacitated. And, and I think that certainly did occur almost throughout history, but has recently changed perhaps over the last 60 years for those who have access to this kind of healthcare. Excellent. Dr. Williams, I like this one. What will I be able to do or not do after my total joint replacement? And maybe your answer might depend on which joint is being replaced, but what are kind of the do's and the don'ts after a replacement? Right. So yeah, we can start from a hip replacement. I think a, a very well done, well positioned hip, you should literally be able to do anything you want. Um, I wouldn't take it to extreme like someone like Bo Jackson, uh, who had a hip replacement and, and destroyed it because of his massive, massive, uh, massive uh, uh, muscle forces on the, on the implant. Uh, but, you know, some light people even go jogging. I think most physicians wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but you certainly can do pretty much anything and almost forget that you have the hip joint in place in terms of your positioning of your, of your uh, joint in space and not worrying about a dislocation. So a hip is an amazing operation. I, I tell patients if I were to have one joint replaced and feel good, likely for the rest of my life, that would be a hip. Uh, knee replacement, again, uh, a great operation. I think sometimes knees are not uh, as thoughtless in terms of you know having one as a hip. People probably know that they have a hip. A hip feels extremely natural. A knee may not, some maybe nowadays do a little bit more so than in the past. Um, but you can pretty much do whatever you want. I would not recommend jogging. I know some people do that. Certainly, uh, you know, people do ski on them, snowboard. I had a, a former patient that was snowboarding uh, this past weekend. Uh, <laughs> you know, swimming, playing golf. Uh, you can pretty much do most things with a knee. Um, 
Anatomic shoulder replacements, again, are similar to hips where really I think you can forget about when I say anatomic, I mean replacement of the joint just as it is in your body. There are more complex shoulder replacements uh, called reverse shoulder replacement where configurations are changed and they're done to bypass certain anatomical structures because of deficiencies. Now, those are the ones where your doctor will say you have a 15 pound uh, weight limit restriction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for most joints, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but I think as a patient, uh, when you speak to your physician, uh, just check with them because there may be certain limitations such as what I just mentioned in a particular shoulder replacement. I appreciate it. Here we go. Let's see the sixth one. Uh, I'm going to do this one and then I'm going to have Dr. Williams give me back. This one's for Dr. G with a hand up to Dr. Williams. Here it is. Are most people happy with total joint replacement? Uh, the answer is yes. I want to shout it out. So uh, actually, as I see, you know, when I see people, I, I still do social business in the hospital. I don't have any admission privileges. The hospital to gave that up yeah. a number of years ago. But when I go and see people, all my patients in the hospital and checking on them after they had joint replacements, and then eventually they see me back in the office after they've seen the orthopedic doc, or they see me for a quick hospital file, the answer is almost always like, why didn't I do this sooner? Do you get that quite a bit, my friend? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, uh, luckily you work at a great center where, you are, where you're around great surgeons. And, you know, unfortunately, there, there are some cases where we, we see bad outcomes. They're rare. Uh, but as you, as you say, you know, when you, you work in a, in a great institute such as yours or in the, in the North Shore Institute or the big institute mm -hmm. where I work, uh, the results that we see are, are fantastic. And there's this rare, there are rare things that can happen. Uh, but generally I would surmise exactly what you say. Uh, the results right. are excellent. I love it. This is what I like to, so I'm skipping around a little bit. Here it is. But, um, uh, what is the most common cause of a failed total joint replacement? Yeah. So, you know, historically it would be the wear of the component, uh, okay. Back in the you know, 70s and 80s, some of the plastic uh, components that were implanted were not as durable as what we have. So over time, uh, those would wear out. The, you can get some instances of what, you, what we call um, septic joints where you develop an infection in there or perhaps some mechanical loosening of the components if there's a lot of stress or if, uh, components are not aligned properly. But it's, it's typically one of those three uh, that cause that. Again, that's rare. I think the failure rate is, is about 1% per year. So at 10 years, 90% of uh, implants should be just fine. Excellent. Appreciate it. Let's see this one. I like this one. This is for you, my friend. Here it is. <clears throat> Are there alternatives to joint replacement? You said a little bit earlier about the the natural progression, but maybe we could talk a little bit more about things like when you know, people are trying to do stem cell therapy, gel yeah. shots, other non-surgical yeah. options. What's your take yeah. on those kind of alternatives? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, gel shots or hyaluronic acid, which is yeah. literally supplementing the flu that's in your joint. I think that's a, that's a great option. And especially in people who don't have as advanced disease, when your disease or your arthritic disease becomes very advanced, some of those um, gel shots uh, tend not to work uh, as well. Um, you know, you, I know, I'm sure your audience is very well um, uh, versed with some of the newer um, things in medicine. Stem cells are cells that can divide down any lineage or any line. So a stem cell can become a hair cell or a skin cell or a joint uh, cartilage cell. And so the idea of injecting stem cells uh, into the joint is to replicate uh, the cartilage that is there and perhaps been worn out. Um, very expensive treatment, uh, perhaps, you know, up to 5,000 uh, an injection. Um, does it work? Um, the literature out there really doesn't support it. Um, there may be some basis for regenerating cartilage, but it's certainly not at the level where you can save the joint for it. So my, you know, my um, advice to patients who ask me about this is, you know, I say, you know, if you really have a lot of money and money that you don't need for other things, <laughs> sure, you can try it, but, you know, have limited expectations. And, um, you know, I, I would not recommend it if you uh, don't have an excess of uh, money, because this is money would be well spent on perhaps, uh, you know, physical therapy or perhaps even your co-pay for a particular procedure that could certainly cure the problem. Dr. Williams, any, any role in maybe doing a 
maybe before you get to a joint replacement, any role in just doing a, a minimally invasive, a, an, an arthroscopic procedure to do, you know, these quote unquote clean outs. Um, is there any role in that or do people yeah. just kind of really go into right into more of the, the joint replacement? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So, uh, you know, with, with arthroscopy, uh, where you put a camera inside a joint and do clean outs, um, they're very narrow indications uh, in the terms of an arthritic knee. When we say an arthritic knee, we're talking about a joint that is wearing out, where you're losing surface cartilage. And the narrow indications will be perhaps a loose body where you're cleaning out something that's floating around the knee and catching. Uh, that would be a good indication. To pull, uh, to put a camera in the knee and do that sort of clean out. But beyond that, there's really um, uh, no good evidence that doing a arthroscopic clean out would delay any type of joint replacement in the future or provide adequate pain relief. I appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Let's do this. Let's do a couple more of these FAQs. I like this. Uh, I like this one. Are there supplements to rebuild cartilage? Yeah, yeah. Um, very good question. So. There, there is some limited literature, perhaps, on, on taking things like chondroitin sulfate. Uh, chondroitin sulfate actually is one of the components that compose uh, cartilage, native cartilage in our joints. And so supplementing this orally, um, although we know it's broken down in the gastrointestinal system and then reabsorbed, uh, there is perhaps some limited evidence that that might help. Uh, you know, things that I do personally, uh, my joints are slowly starting to wear out as well. Uh, taking omega threes, uh, you know, some of those things uh, help. And um, you know, one that is not really building cartilage, but certainly may make your joints feel better, is interesting enough vitamin D. Um, and so, I'm, I'm sure your your patients uh, often supplement with a vitamin D, as a lot of us need to supplement. Yeah, uh, ensuring that your vitamin D levels are up to uh, up to the appropriate levels can make your joints feel. A little bit better. All right. I love it. And you had a segue. I love how you mentioned the omega threes, you know, because people will always say, can I help? Can I naturally lubricate my joints? And, yeah. you know, I always say kind of consuming those healthy fats uh, um, can certainly increase joint health and lubrication. Yeah. I would say like from a dietary standpoint, we should always be eating part of this anti-inflammatory uh, type diet, but eating things like those the Mediterranean, the salmon, the trout, the mackerel, the avocados, the olive oil, the walnuts, the chia seeds. I think that should just, I think that just represents good nutrition. Uh, and if you get some joint benefits on top of that sound nutrition, then, you know, it's great. Um, but, but we want people to be approached holistically into their health. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's interesting enough that, you know, I'm, I'm big into brain health as well. And a lot of those things yeah. that you just mentioned are, are really brain. good for, for your brain. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think omega threes are a big one for joints, um, and certainly can benefit other areas in the body as well. All right, I like this one. Here we go. What can I do? A few more of these. What can I do to decrease my risk of complications from joint replacement surgery? Yeah, yeah, um, excellent. And I think all of us uh, like to uh, be aware of things like that when we undergo a procedure. So number one. Uh, if you're obese, meaning morbidly obese, um, and, and he, if you go to a surgeon, the surgeon agrees to perform a procedure on you, um, he may not or she may not be doing you a favor. We know once your BMI is above 40, you're putting yourself at risk. Regardless of who the surgeon is, there's harder retraction on the tissues, which means you can damage a ligament, you can injure a nerve or a blood vessel, and there's a higher risk of malalignment of the component. Even if the procedure goes well, now you're at a higher risk of an infection, you're a higher risk of a blood clot, and you're a higher risk of many other bad things of happening down the road, including mechanical failure of the device because of all the load that it's taking. It's similar to a car. If you have a car, and the car is six months old, but you've driven 300,000 miles because you're driving 24 hours, the car is going to break down. And if you have a joint replacement and you're carrying 600 pounds on you and you're just walking four miles a day, that's going to take a, a, an exponential more amount of load than perhaps a 130 uh, pound, you know, 80 year old female. Um, walking around. So to decrease your complication rate, I would say, number one, get your weight into an optimal state. Um, 
that's that's the biggest thing I would say. Number two, we spoke about this earlier, no smoking. Uh, no, number three, uh, get your nutrition right. And then the final one is you really have to do due diligence because you want the right technician operating on you. You can have all those three components correct, but if you choose the, the wrong surgeon, meaning not a high volume surgeon mm -hmm. and not a surgeon that's trained in that particular area, I think you're doing yourself a disservice, and especially in a city like Chicago, when you have access to all the great surgeries that we do. All right, let's see this last FAQ. I like this one. Is physical therapy necessary after joint recovery? Is anybody trying to like fight you for like trying to like, like <laughs> Doc, I don't need to do therapy. I feel great. I, I mean, I feel great. I don't need therapy, yeah. right, Doc? <laughs> you're like, uh, you, know, you probably say, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> yeah. No, you, well, don't, well, you need therapy. Well, with all our great surgeons at North Shore, they don't need any therapy. Well, let's just put it that way. Uh, well, no, all, all kidding aside, I think uh, most joints need therapy. If you have one joint that you might get away without therapy, it's perhaps a hip because you can walk and do a lot of things and sit, and that gives you almost all the range of motion that you need. And now you're just building uh, endurance in some of the muscles. Uh, uh, knees need a lot of therapy. Shoulders need a lot of therapy. And I would argue that hips need them as well. So the answer to that is if you want to have the best possible outcome, you want to be walking around without a limp. You want to be performing at a high level where you know that you're, you know, very confident in your new joint, you need therapy. Wonderful. I appreciate that. I got to tell you this, tell you this quick story, doc. Um, and I'll get a lot of times I'll see people uh, within the first few days after they get discharged from uh, if it's a hospital stay or it's just more just outpatient day procedure, they go home. I'll see them within usually a few days of my small practice. And so one of the first things I say to them, like, you're, you're on that therapy, right? So they know like Dr. G's coming out of like, okay, I know. And, and like, I might've seen, seen them before they might see my orthopedic colleagues, maybe two days later, I go, that's the first thing the doc's going to say too, when you get it to his or her office, but I'm telling you now, how's that therapy going? No, absolutely. Going. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I think therapy is key. Therapy yeah. is absolutely key. At, you know, just reactivating the, the muscles, yeah. ensuring that your your um, your recovery is as fast and as seamless as possible. Therapy. Yeah, man, I got it. All right. Yeah. So, hey, you're listening here. You know, we're here right now on Health 360 with Dr. G. I'm sitting down with uh, Dr. Dennis Williams, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we're talking joint health, uh, timing, joint replacement, timing and techniques 101. I love it. So, Doc, we do a section on Health 360 with Dr. G on each episode called Myths versus Facts. And that's about yeah. setting the record straight. So, here's how it'll work I'll say the statement, and then you, my friend, say myth or fact. And then you explain why it's a myth or fact. We'll kind of go boom, 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 try to see how many get through yeah. these. But it's all yeah. about for people listening to set the record straight. This first fact. So I present to you joint replacement one on one myths versus facts. So here we go. I like this first one, Dr. Williams. Myth or fact? Please explain. Stem cell therapy is a good alternative to knee replacement. Myth. Uh, stem cell therapy is something you can consider if you have an abundance of money, but will not replace uh, your knee. That certainly could potentially make you feel better uh, in certain uh, types of arthritis, very mild perhaps, but certainly will not uh, do the function of a knee replacement of severely arthritic knee. That's a myth. All right. All right, here we go. I like this next one. Myth of fact, please explain. Here it is. There are activities I should not do after knee replacement. That's a fact. Uh, after a knee replacement, you can pretty much do almost anything you want, but you should not kneel on your knee, especially if the knee is, the kneecap is replaced. You can damage your kneecap. All right, here we go. At least one myth or fact, please explain. A joint implant will only last me 10 years. That's a myth. I think nowadays, uh, if your joint replacement is done well, it's aligned appropriately, you respect yes. it. You don't mm -hmm. insult your knee joint or your hip joint. By running ultra marathons, perhaps you could be one of those people <laughs> that has one joint that's done after the age of 55 and perhaps lasts you for the rest of your life. Um, lasting 10 years is, I would say, not the standard and not the expectation for most joints. I think most joints nowadays, if they're done well and you respect them and you're not unlucky to get an infection, should last you considerably longer than 10 years. Wonderful. Appreciate it. Here we go. I like this one for you. Myth or fact, please explain. I shouldn't consider having surgery until the pain is unbearable. That's a myth. 
I think, you know, everyone has a different standard what unbearable is, but I think nowadays unbearable to me would mean suicidal pain. And I think you should have your knee or your hip or your shoulder, whatever joint it is, uh, addressed prior to get to that stage. We live in a, in a society where we should be able to control pain till we, uh, uh, you know, are at a point where we can't control it. And at that point, then go to a joint replacement. Don't go to all the way to that point. That's unbearable. Excellent. Here we go. Like this is Dr. Williams, is for you. Um, Mithra, please explain. I'm too young or too old for a joint replacement. That is both a myth and a fact, and I'll explain. Okay, well, all right, please um, do. So, uh, you know, if you're in your 20s, um, you certainly can have a joint replaced if it is absolutely destroyed. Uh, but in general, you want to wait all the way until you're at least in your 50s or perhaps in your 60s. Now, uh, people may say a 90-year-old is too old for a joint replacement, but nowadays, as you and I both know, there's some 90 year olds that are physiologically perhaps in their 70s. And so we have to take yes. into account people's, uh, you know, perhaps age that is not beyond the chronological age and more of the, their health age. And so you can certainly perform operations on people well into their 90s with the expectation of good outcomes. So I think age should be taken into account and there are some exceptions. And that's why I answer the question that way. Excellent. Here we go. This is a this is gonna be a Dr. G myth or fact, but with a Dr. Williams, uh, uh, me passing on to Dr. Williams to complete my statement, my response to this. But here we go. I like this. One. This is for Dr. G, then a Dr. Williams. Here it is. Um, here's a statement. I won't be able to maintain an active lifestyle um, and be after my joint replacement. I'll say that is a myth. It's the exact opposite. We want you to return to an active and pain-free lifestyle after surgery. And of course, talk to your surgeon for more information. Dr. Williams, take it over, take it from there. I just passed the baton. <laughs> I agree with that statement 100%. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. Here we go. Myth of fact, please, we'll do two more of these. This is for you, my friend. Uh, here's a statement. I'll be in the hospital for a week after my joint replacement. That is a myth. I think nowadays, uh, our average length of stay, depending on where you go, is anywhere from two days uh, to a little bit below that. To perhaps a little bit above that. In fact, a lot of joints nowadays are done as outpatients. Uh, I do a majority of my shoulders as outpatient. A lot of my colleagues in the North Shore system do their hips and knees as outpatients. So it would be exceedingly rare for a patient nowadays with our methods of pain control and more minimally invasive techniques to be in a hospital for a week and uh, even longer than that. That's, that's simply, I would say, a myth for nowadays. All right, here we go. This is the last one. This is for you, my friend. Here is myth of fact, please explain. I'll have to go to a rehab facility after my joint replacement. That is a myth. Um, while it may occur in very rare of circumstances, mm -hmm. I would say that is really a myth. And nowadays the expectation is to go home. There are a few patients that do require uh, more extended care, perhaps for other comorbidities that may be exacerbated after the procedure. But I would say that most surgeons would say that their patients are going home. Excellent. So there you have it, everybody. Myths versus facts. So we have about five minutes left. You know, in the beginning, we call it the chief complaint. In the end, we call it the assessment and plan. And that's when we give somebody a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and of course, we scheduled that follow-up. So Dr. Williams, uh, people have been listening to the show today. Um, give us a few take-up points for those patients that are out there, people that are out there, where, whether it's them or a loved one that may be on this path towards joint replacement based on their conversations with their physician. What, what take-up points should they get from today's show? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say your take-home points today are do not jump, jump to a joint replacement. Joint replacement is a great operation in the right patient after exhausting all conservative treatment. So what does that mean? To me, that means that you have tried anti-inflammatories, you have tried some physical therapy and some home exercises. Um, then you've gone to your physician and, and said, listen, that's not working. Now your physician has said, okay, well, let's try a steroid injection, which is a high dose of anti-inflammatory placed directly in the joint. My father calls these smart bombs rather than the old style warfare <laughs> carpet bombs. 
so some smart bombs and steroids prep at the, at the site of the arthritis, and then perhaps even a gel injection, and then continue with that as long as you can. Once that fails, then you're at the point where I would approach uh, a joint replacement. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Williams. And before we get to my final thoughts, we're doing a section here called Listener Healthy Oh Yeah Content. So this is a quote from a loyal listener. So here's the quote. Quote, me focusing on taking care of me, much needed, end quote. That's from a loyal listener, SRP. And I genuinely enjoy hearing about your journey. And with your permission, I will read on the show. Just simply message me across all the socials at health 360 wg And who knows, your story may be a catalyst for someone who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. If you and your orthopedic surgeon have decided that you're a good candidate for a joint replacement, then rest assured that you are in good company as 1.25 million hip and knee replacement surgeries were performed in the United States in 2019. Never hesitate to ask questions. Your doctor and healthcare team will help you prepare for surgery. The goal from our end as clinicians and to yours as patients is the same to relieve pain, and to restore function. So I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Dennis Williams, board-certified orthopedic surgeon, Swedish Medical Group, chairman, Department of Surgery at Swedish Hospital. Dr. Williams, thanks for coming on the show, my friend. Dr. Gomez, thank you for having me. It's great seeing you again. I know. We'll catch up soon. Hey, everybody, you've been listening to and watching Health360 with Dr. G, Healthy Driven Podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2023, Edward Elmer's Health. All rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all the socials at Health360 W. Dr. G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace. Out.